Hello, my name is Patrick Stewart. I am your host for the Dallas Corner podcast. I am the founder and chief editor of two publications now, the Dallas Online and the, as of tomorrow, Project Jade. For those who may be new, uh, what I do here is we're working through a book called 365 Dow by Deeming Dow. Uh, Deeming Dow is a great writer who wanted to take the ancient ideas of Taoism uh, philosophy and put them to a more modern setting and relate them to our lives. Because you know what? Sometimes a book that's been written 2,500 years ago doesn't exactly sound like something that would do with us. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised, but ancient China and modern day America, maybe not the same, you know, maybe, maybe we're different just a little bit. So Ding Ling Dao decided to go ahead and <clears throat> make a daily devotional book. And so I'm going to work through it with you guys and see how it goes. I'm on chapter 17 or episode 17. Uh, chapter 90, actually, of the book. And we usually do about four or five uh, chapters a day, every Sunday, 9 a.m. Central Time, uh, live on YouTube, if you ever want to tune in. Or you can, of course, listen to the audio on any podcast network, Spotify, Apple. All right. So if you don't know what Taoism is, Taoism is obviously, as I said, from ancient China, created by a legendary author named Lao Tzu. Uh, there's some debate on whether or not he was real, kind of like a King Arthur type figure. Um, but he supposedly was a librarian in the emperor's court and decided that he was kind of done with all the madness of um, his current life and decided to retire out on the countryside, never to be seen from again. Before, but, but, but before he left, a border guard stopped him and asked him to write down words of wisdom. So he wrote the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching is uh, 81 short poems or passages, if you were, uh, that explained how to live in a harmonious lifestyle. Um, harmony within yourself, harmony with nature, harmony with those around you, and really bring um, balance and peace to yourself and your mind. So that's the goal. Uh, I'm going to try and unpack that for you guys. Uh, but first, two announcements. The first announcement is this. This is a see-through book. Uh, it's not see-through in reality. It is kind of green, so you're probably seeing most of the background. Uh, but it's my book. I spent the last year writing this book. It's called... A Beginner's Guide to Taoism, and it's available now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the above. If you try to buy the paperback on Amazon, you have to click on all the editions and pick the other paperback, or else it'll tell you it's temporarily out of stock, because distributors are a pain in the butt. Second announcement is tomorrow, uh, the second publication I've ever run, uh, Project Jade is coming out. Our first article will be published. Project Jade is a fully professional curated selection from the Taoist Online. The Taoist Online is a free publication on medium.com, but this one's going to be our own. We're going to go ahead and try and control the full process and flow from start to finish. We're paying all the authors this time instead of medium kind of paying them per view. And we'll see how it goes. We've got one article per day um, for every day in January. And then we're going to bump it to maybe two articles per day towards the end and into February. We'll just see how it goes. Uh, it is the culmination of months of work from several, several different people. So a big congrats and a shout out to all those guys over at the Dallas Online who have helped. And of course, we wouldn't be here without all of our amazing authors. Uh, we almost have, uh, we're pushing the thousand writers for the Taoist Online so far over there at Medium. So if you want to read what we're putting out, the Taoist.online, if you want to read Project Jade tomorrow, that's projectjade.net. Okay, let's get started. We're going to go, I believe, into chapter 90. 
because I think we did chapter 89 last week because I started reading it and it sounds familiar. So here we go. Chapter 90. Longevity. Contemplate in the morning. Pull weeds in the afternoon. The joys and labor of a single day are part of a whole journey. If all you want is spiritual realization, it isn't that difficult. For the average person, a dozen years under the guidance of a good teacher will probably give it to you. That's shorter than what it takes to be a good musician, athlete, or artist. It's even shorter than the time it will take you to collect your pension. If you have the good fortune to study with the right person, you can succeed in a relatively short amount of time. But after you get it, then what? Many of us place such an emphasis on attaining realization that we may forget to put it in context. What actually matters is to walk Tao, maintaining vitality until we meet our end in a timely way. Spiritual realization is essential, but it is not everything. A starving person dwells inordinately on the thought of food. Likewise, a spiritual, hungry person can only think of realization. One who has food can place it in the right context, just as one who has understanding can place it in the correct perspective. Followers of Tao, therefore, do not emphasize enlightenment as an ultimate goal. For them, realization is a means, not an end. Their emphasis is on the act of living. They use the word longevity not because they want to live forever, but because it symbolizes their determination to live the entire course of their lives well. Hmm. All right. Let's talk about that. There's this story, this, this chapter reminds me of a story where uh, you had a, a traveler like walking down the side of the road and he comes across this enlightened person and he said master master you know after you know after enlightenment you know what do you what do you do and the enlightened person simply picked up his bag and walked off hey yeah get it so yeah that was the enlightenment <clears throat> i mean it's, obviously it's it's a spiritual goal Right. I mean, there are goals that you should be striving for and the uh, ways of life you should in a way of mind you can attain, obtain. That's not the end. You don't just cease to exist. I mean, even the Buddha, I mean, he he obtained enlightenment and he didn't just go, well, I guess that's it, guys. Bye. <laughs> you know, he lived a long full life with the family and servants for not servants followers and you know wrote a lot but um yeah even even modern life you know if you somehow obtain this grand spiritual place your life and your duties and your responsibilities don't end you have to move on and move forward and go your, do your job and take care of your house and your family. It, it doesn't end with enlightenment, guys. Uh, and I know before you kind of get to that space, you, that's all you want. You just, you just want to study your religious texts and you know, practice your meditation. And one day, it's like you think this big light is going to open up above your head or you're going to hear this giant gong and you're just going to get it. You're like, ah, this is it. And then what happens, right? It's that's the important part. That's the key is you have to keep going. So for Taoists, while reaching that desired spiritual goal of your training is nice and it's important and you, you should you should work towards that. Um, it's always important to remember that the, the goal, the, the main goal for us is to live a fulfilling life, um, a harmonious life with those around us within yourself and with the Tao. So yes, longevity, not, not just spirituality, longevity. Yeah, it's the journey, not the destination. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, perfect. 
yeah, it's it's the climb to quote Hannah Montana. Been watching a lot of Hannah Montana lately because my ten year old loves that show. So <laughs> shout out to, to all the people who grew up watching that show. Okay, <laughs> going back. We are going to chapter 91, Funeral. Hurts of weathered black enamel, undertakers fingering cigarettes. Family, some crying, some bored, some only thinking of themselves. Hired marching band out of tune, even in death, we find no accord. If you look closely closely at a dead person, you can truly see, or can you truly see a soul? Is there anything left for the person that you knew? Nope. There is only a corpse, one that doesn't even look familiar. Whatever animates people is gone. Have they flown to heaven? Have they gone into some cycle of transmigration? I don't know. Theories about what happens after death can only be conjecture. A funeral is for those left behind. It is a ritual for us to come to grips with what has happened. Sometimes, one wonders if the weeping is more out of fear for ourselves than it is sympathy for the deceased. All our lives we seek union. We try to please our parents. We try to do well for our teachers and society. We try to make love and get married. We try to touch the universal through, the uni the universal through art, music, and meditation. Yet all our lives, our every attempt, is flawed. Accord and harmony are transitory states. Their duration and quality come only from our determination. Once our mind gives away, we can no longer hold the connections that we want. Don't wait for death to solve your difficulties. Do what you must while you are alive. So... I took private lessons from a Taoist teacher for about two or three months until he went back to China and George, George Thompson, I highly recommend his YouTube channel. Um, he's, he's a great teacher. I learned almost everything about Taoism and philosophy from, from him. So shout out to George. If he happens to see this, but he had a video once where his grandfather died and he talked a little bit about um, death, being sad. And this really hints at that sadness, right? That you feel when someone you love passes away. And you can look at it in kind of two ways, right? You can look at death from like the physical sense, like what? What happens to your consciousness? Like, do you go somewhere? Like, are you awake somewhere? Um, you know, spiritually. And then you can look what happens to your body. And you can kind of, by observation, look around. I mean, when I see a animal die, it, I don't know. It, it, it does look different. Um, it's certainly not moving right i know it's hard to describe if you've ever seen a dead animal like on the side of the road we have a lot of roadkill here in texas uh so that happens but uh it, it's not the same if you've ever been to a funeral you'll look at that too and you'll be like hey that's it doesn't look like them why doesn't that look like them right and all the theories about the afterlife from a Taoist perspective are really not worth debating in that regard because you can't change anything whatever's going to happen is going to happen and that's it right so if you can't control anything beyond that state beyond that point of death then your existence really becomes about your existence right living isn't a means to an end it is the end. So even if you believe in the afterlife, here, let me put it to you this way. Let's say there is no afterlife. And you're going to be on this planet for a hundred years. Are you going to spend your only hundred years 
always concerned about what comes next? Or are you going to take those hundred years and focus on what you can control, which is your relationships, your progress, your spiritual journey, your job, your family, right? Isn't that worth it? Shouldn't that come first? Like the whole don't count your chickens before they hatch kind of thing, right? Like someone's got to sit on those eggs, right? You got to put in the work while you're here. Like don't just always think about what's in the future. Like don't just think about the reward. It's, it's about how you get there. I mean, I know we just talked about it. It's the journey, not the destination. And that is true in the afterlife as well. I've been to a lot of funerals over my years, uh, unfortunately, and some funerals are strange. <laughs> some funerals are just weird. Um, you know, either you don't know who they are, and so you're just kind of sitting there, and it gets awkward. Like, everyone's sad, and you're like, should I feel sad? Right? And that's when you remember, oh, yeah, this, is, this isn't for the person who's laying over there in the casket. It's for us, right? It's to celebrate. So if you ever watch different cultures celebrate funerals differently, uh, it's really different. Like, it's, it's pretty amazing how, how different... Countries and civilizations have, have celebrated or mourned uh, funerals. All right, but yeah, don't let, don't let your goal of the afterlife overshadow living, right? Even if you believe in an afterlife, living is still important. The way you treat others is still important. Heather says, yeah, I don't think I'm going to anymore, not even mine. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Chapter 92. Accuracy. Make every move count. Pick your target and hit it. Perfect concentration means effortless flowing. A life that is spiritual requires focused action. It needs quick reflexes, accurate timing, and abundant skill. That is why followers of Tao are always compounding their self-cultivation. They want the ability to do whatever they want. Each day your life grows a day shorter. Make every move count. All that matters is accomplishing what you envision with the greatest dispatch. Once you do, that aspect of your interest is discharged, and you can then go on to some new interest. If you do not engage in this ongoing process of action, you will never satisfy all the various aspects of the soul, and realization will never fully mature for you. Some assert that there is no end to desire, so we should undercut our ambition, but this doesn't address the need for satisfaction. When uh, we need to have satisfaction in what we do in order to have a good sense of well-being. If we undercut our ambition, then we will never make any achievements nor satisfy our yearnings. This only leaves us with frustration, uh, uncertainty, and timidity. Therefore, to follow Tao, we must identify our inner longings and dispatch them with a hunter's accuracy. Okay, cool. All right. So let's talk about this one. Uh, ambition, desires, goals. You know, uh, you know. I think when people think about you know spirituality and, and mindfulness, they they always turn to like a Buddhist monk, right? No possessions. They sit there. They they live in a monastery. They just like do nothing. All they do is meditate all day, and you know, no worldly possessions. Okay, and Taoism. That's not that's not us, right? In Taoism, we would say, if you desire something, you should work towards it. Right? Your natural instincts and your natural emotions are a part of you. And by denying those ambitions and by denying those goals, you're denying a piece of yourself. 
which, as this chapter eloquently puts, leads to frustration, right? And despair and sadness. Um, well, how do we do that, right? How do we, how do we continue to, to strive for that? Self-cultivation, meditation, right? Um, here in the chapter, it says, that is why followers of Tao are always compounding their self-cultivation, right? Each day, your life grows shorter. Make every move count. All that matters is accomplishing what you envision with the greatest dispatch. Like sense of urgency, right? Um, I'll put it to you this way. You know, a year ago, I wanted to write a book. And I had always wanted to write a book. Um, I'd written a book of poetry uh, 20 years ago, but I was really just collecting some work I had done in school and putting it together and sending it out. Uh, but this book, I really wanted to write um, as, a, as a real flowing thing. And I did. And I did it with a search sense of urgency, right? I, but, you know, what if I had looked at myself and said, well, that's too ambitious. Well, I shouldn't be so ambitious. I should just sit here at home and do my job and be happy and make the money I make. And, you know, why have, why have more goals? Or, you know, a, a month or two ago, I was thinking, you know, I'd like to do this weekly podcast series about this book. And you know what, man, my camera looks kind of, kind of bad. My, you know, my editing skills aren't good. And yeah, I should just, uh, you know, do what I can and make it kind of a cruddy product and whoever likes it can like it. No, no. Have goals. When you dedicate yourself to something, you go for it. You don't half-ass anything, right? I wanted, I wanted a better camera, so I worked with my wife to let her, to, to get her to let me buy one. <laughs> um, you know, I got better lighting and I got this green screen and I learned software and here we are, right? Um, you know, that doesn't make me an, an, an overly ambitious person, right? I honestly, I don't understand that phrase sometimes, overly ambitious. Oh, I feel, I want too much, I feel too much. <laughs> it's like saying overly emotional, like, oh, Sorry, I feel human too much for you. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's that, that part of yourself is okay, right? Those positive parts of yourself, we should embrace those, right? We should love that about ourselves and about each other, right? We should want to strive for quality. Um, and the same thing goes for our maybe not so positive side. Right? Um, like our sadness and our grief. Those are a part of you. And your anger, that's a part of you. You can't shun different parts of you and expect to just wake up one day and be happy all the time. It doesn't work like that. We're, we have these emotions and these feelings for a reason. In fact, on this yin yang right here, I know it's hard to see. Okay, that symbol is supposed to be in motion, right? It represents existence. Yin over yang, and then yang over yin, then yin over yang, and so forth and so on. You're happy, and then you're sad, and then you're happy, and then you're sad. You can't be sad all the time, just like you can't be happy all the time. Everything is in balance, right? Everything moves and changes. Um, you know, we had a saying in my old job that the only thing that stays the same is that everything changes right um so you yeah you, it's it's not bad to be ambitious or to have goals it simply is a part of you and you should accept that and love yourself if you find yourself as the ambitious person which i guess i do i guess i am an ambitious person even though those guys just have hobbies, like you have like a million hobbies and they always seem to bounce from one hobby to the next. And you're like, man, how does he have all that time? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am that person. All right, let's move on. Chapter 93, Confidence. 
Truth perceived gives assurance. Skill yields self-reliance. With courage, we can defy danger. To increase power, increase humility. Through constant temptation, we can arrive at the truth. The more experienced we are, the more thorough our understanding, and thus the more we can come to rely on our knowledge. When we exercise what we know, it not only extends our understanding but the truth of the truth, but helps us take action in meaningful ways. The more we do, the more self-reliant we are. Every achievement brings a wonderful dividend of confidence. We try greater and greater ventures until we are brave enough to accomplish undertakings far beyond what the average person imagines. When we reach that level of consummate skill, it is a time of both celebration and extreme caution. We are justified to rejoice, for this is the level of ability that we have been striving so long and hard to attain. It is also time for caution, because the foolish will eventually try something too great for them to handle. Pride and passion will lead to their downfall. Therefore, the more accomplished ones becomes the more uh, circums circumspect one should be. The higher one's skill, the more precarious one's road. The more powerful followers of Tao are also among the most humble. By veiling their light until the proper moments, they escape the greatest danger of all. Hubris. There's a chapter in the Yao yeah, Jing that talks about knowing when to speak and when to stay silent. In fact, it goes on to say that the master really doesn't say much at all. Uh, we are content with letting nature take its course, letting people be who they are naturally and only really stepping in when we're asked to or when we really feel led to. Now, it's kind of a trick, right? I, I, there's some banging the heads there because, you know, what if it feels natural for me to step in? But it also just said the... You know, the, the thing we should watch out for the most is hubris. So, like, how do you know? Well, it's not easy. Life is never easy. You know, I'm a, I'm a manager at work. I'm a senior customer support manager. I have a team of eight. And more often than not, I let them handle their own problems, right? I empower them to handle a situation. Now, if they need me, if something gets out of hand, absolutely they can come to me and I will help them as fast as humanly possible. I will have their back. I'll back them up. I'm not going to throw them under the bus. But they are empowered to solve their own issues, knowing they have my full support. Now, I could micromanage them, but who wants to work there? Right? Who, who wants a manager like that? Who's like always coming down on you and always making you try and be perfect and never gives you room to be who you are? Nobody. <laughs> I can't think of anybody who wants to work in that type of environment. Um, so that really flows pretty well with Dow, right? Dow moves quietly. It moves in all things, but it does so without striving it does so without beating someone over the head right you can ignore you know think of it like this if you're if you fell into a river okay and you have two choices you can relax and let the river try to carry you closer to shore and you swim a little bit conserve your energy or you can swim like hell maybe to the side, kind of against the current, and hope you reach it before you drown. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to choose option number one, where I can serve my, my energy and just try to nudge myself over to the side 
a little bit, right? Um, have the confidence to do what you need to do, right? Let's bring it back to the chapter now. When you make an achievement as a leader, well, when you do make an achievement, you are a leader. You have achieved something. You are a wise person in whatever you just achieved. But be careful, like we were saying earlier, not to overexert yourself, right? If you are in that river, don't swim too hard to the side because you're going to fight that current, right? Let yourself be, be pulled. Let yourself go. Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult. A hubris and, man, being arrogant. Nobody likes, to have, nobody likes to show off, right? Nobody likes to show off. Maybe that's, what the, maybe that's the whole summary of this chapter. <laughs> Don't be a turd. Okay. Chapter 94. Practice. Spiritual success is gained by daily cultivation. If you practice for the day, then you have won. If you were lazy for the day, then you have lost. Self-cultivation is the heart of spiritual attainment. Gaining insight and ability is not a matter of grand statements, dramatic initiations, or sporadic movements of enlightenment. Those things are only highlights in a life of constant activity, consistent activity. Whatever system of spirituality you practice, do it every day. If it is prayer, then pray every day. If it is meditation, then meditate every day. If it is exercise, then exercise every day. Only then will you be able to say that you are truly practicing spirituality. This, metho this methodical approach is reassuring in several ways. First, it provides you with a process and a means to maintain progress even in that particular day, even if that particular day is not inspiring or significant. Just to practice is already good. Secondly, it gives you a certain faith. If you practice every day, it is inevitable that you will gain from it. Thirdly, constant practice gives you a certain satisfaction. How can you say to yourself that you have truly earned a spiritual path unless you can look back on years of daily practice and take comfort in the momentum that it has given you? Yeah. All right. Practice. There you go. There's the book. <clears throat> so I have tinnitus, which is a severe ringing in my ears. And it happened about two years ago where my ears just started hearing this ring and it just never went away. And after about three weeks of that, you will freak out. <laughs> you will go into panic attacks and anxiety attacks. And then about three weeks after that, you'll kind of wish you could just stab yourself in the ear and hope that it goes away. Um, but eventually it gets better and you adjust. But you know what? Sleeping is still kind of hard uh, at that time. So I began a daily practice. And that practice was breathing to help me go to sleep. Um, I do a breathing practice called 478. Uh, four, you breathe in for four, hold for seven, out for eight, and repeat the cycle. Now, I didn't say seconds. It just, just counts. So faster than seconds, don't, don't pass out. But what that does is help slow my heart rate um, and relax, right? And I noticed that it actually put me to sleep. So I used to be the person uh, all through my adult life who would lay there for 20, 30 minutes and never, never could go to sleep. It would just take forever. And I also used to think that the only way to sleep was to clear your mind of all the thoughts and stop thinking. You know how difficult it is to stop thinking? It's impossible. Like, I, maybe you can do it. Maybe someone listening on this can do it. I, I can't, right? I can't do that. What I did find, however, is that through this breathing practice, I don't have to clear my mind. My body will naturally go to sleep anyway. 
which was great. It was like magic. I couldn't believe it. Um, but not only that, that daily practice of breathing when stressed out, because again, anxiety, panic attacks, tinnitus, right? Practicing it at that moment actually caused me to remember that practice instinctively when I'm frustrated or upset or angry just in my day-to-day life, right? I found myself slowing my breath down. It just would come to me, that four, seven, eight practice all the time, uh, anytime I'm frustrated. So in this chapter, when it gets to your spiritual practice and self-cultivation, it is so key to do it every single day to see benefits of it, right? And I'm not talking about, you know, like when I grew up in church as a Christian, they would talk about, you know, getting closer to God. And I was like, well, aren't we going to die and go closer to God anyway? Like, how close to God do I need? Isn't God everywhere? Like, how close can I get there? <laughs> um, but no, 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 no. Don't think of it like that, right? You're not getting closer to a person or a spiritual being. You're getting closer to who you are truly inside, right? You are unlocking pieces and parts of yourself to open yourself up to the world around you, right? Think of it like half of you is on one side of a door and half of you is on the other side of the door. And, or actually, let me, let me take that back. <clears throat> when you're born, you are 100% naturally you. You're not influenced by language. You're not influenced by society, your parents, your rules, like nothing, right? You just are 100% human. It's the only time in your entire life you're going to be that way, right? And as you grow up, you learn language, you learn definitions, you learn categories, um, societal rules and manipulations and all that stuff. And so now, you know, that wall between who you used to be, not that natural version of you, and the current version of you is like a brick wall, right? And you got a piece by piece. You're going to have to take down that wall, right? Brick by brick. And, you know, yeah, every once in a while, you could take like a spoon and like scratch that brick and you make progress. You're technically closer to the other side of that wall. But, uh, you know, if you really want to get there, maybe you should take a hammer and start an every day just wailing away on that wall, right? But what does that look like in real life? It looks like meditating. It looks like prayer. It looks like exercise. It looks like breathing, uh, eating right, um, brushing your teeth every day, right? Showering every day. Like th those are practices that you do every single day that get you more to who you naturally are. Or cleaning yourself, you're cleaning your mind and your spirit. And eventually, you will get back to that person. But you got to practice. I know we're busy. We're really, really busy individuals. <laughs> and we have all kinds of stuff. So do I. I have two jobs. I have three children, one wife, two dogs, a cat, a fish, a house. It is madness. Okay. It's madness. That's why my practice was while falling asleep, because it was the only real time I had to myself. There was going, closing my eyes and trying to go to sleep, but it worked. It took a while, it took months, but it did work. So it can work for you too, in whatever it is, whatever goal you're trying to achieve, whatever skill you're trying to obtain, make sure you do it every day and you'll get there. Okay. Chapter 95. Oh, Heather says, we have to make it a priority and make the time for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, make it a priority. You, you are a priority. Dang it. <laughs> Your emotions are a priority, right? Your needs are also a priority sometimes. 
right? Don't uh, don't just sacrifice for someone all the time, right? Because you matter. Your emotions matter. Your feelings matter. Yeah. Okay. Ninety-five. Travel. Body is the tabernacle. Traveling one thousand miles, the gods are still in place. The body is a temple of the gods. It should be kept clean and pure so that the holiest of events can take place. Sacred, it should be kept undefiled. Uh, Consecrated, its interior is where the deepest questions are explored. In olden times, the devout carried tabernacles so that they could keep up with their devotions even when far from their homes. Their gods were inside these boxes, protected and treasured. Followers of Tao believe that their gods are within themselves. Therefore, whenever they go, they carry the gods with them. During their travels, when they come to a resting place, they open not a receptacle, but themselves. They carry their sense of place, quotations, within themselves. Even while sojourning, they remain oriented to their inner sacredness. Perhaps they can even make breakthroughs more quickly, for the preoccupations of the mind are no longer present to interfere with the flow of the divine. Once people connect to their inner strength, there is no need to the wonders of travel. So there's a, there's a line in the Tao Te Ching where it's like, you know, one can see the universe from looking out the window. It's translated in a couple of different ways, uh, depending on uh, which English translation you're, you're taking a look at. But that's the, that's, the, that's the gist of it, right? That's how I like to say it, is even if you're just sitting in your house, you can unlock the mysteries of the universe within yourself. And that's what this chapter is kind of getting at, right? Uh, think of it like if you've read the Bible, um, in ancient times, the Jewish people had, um, oh my gosh, they carried around this box with Moses' bones. And if like anyone, oh, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And you've ever seen Indiana, if you've seen Indiana Jones in the, in the Temple of Doom, like this, oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what it is. Like, they, it's this golden statue, and they touch it and die. Okay, but inside, they thought God resided there, right? That's why you died if you touched it. Well, in Taoism, uh, we believe that our gods are internal, right? The Tao is within us. The Tao is within everything. So in order to know Tao, in order to unlock Tao within ourselves, there's no need to go anywhere. I don't have to journey to a holy place because I am the holy place, right? You are the holy place. I don't need to visit, I don't know, the Middle East or China or Japan or wherever you are in Europe, um, those places are great. And I've, I've traveled overseas. I've been to a couple of different countries and it's amazing. I'm not saying don't go. You should go if you ever get a chance. But spiritually speaking, your God is not in France. Okay. It's not in a hole somewhere in Egypt, right? It is within. So through meditation, through that daily practicing we were just talking about in the last chapter, you can find everything you need to find, right? I think sometimes it's easy to say these things when you're sitting in a comfy house with a family and everything seems to be going great, right? Maybe not so easy when you're like poor and you're sleeping on the side of the road. I get it. I understand. However, the truth is that even if the world rages around you, your spiritual goal is to maintain that truth of who you are, 
right? No matter what is happening around you, no matter where you are, if you've traveled, if you're sitting in home, if you're laying in bed, if you went through a hard time, or you got broken up with, or you, somebody passed away, whatever it is, right? Your tabernacle is within you. Just think about that today. As you go about your day, try and, try and be silent for just a little bit and see what you hear, right? See if, if you're called to go somewhere or if you're called to just hang out. It could be either one. But it's important to listen, right? It's important to take time to understand what's going on around you. Sometimes we'll be happy at home, just where you are. Okay, we're going to do one more. If I can get this to flip. There it is. All right, 96, constancy, clear sunlight on falling snow, fire and ice, bare-boned trees stark to the horizon, cold marshes, havens to ducks and geese, a groundhog sits motionless on a post. Wherever we are, the constant flow of Tao is ever-present. We see the cycle of opposites, just as the juxtaposition of sunlight and snow. We notice the ongoing rhythms of life, waterfowl carrying on their lives even as spring is slow to warm and leafless trees stand in anticipation of warmer weather. All things change. All things move constantly. The world is like the ongoing turning of a magnificent wheel. All things come in their own time. Just as a groundhog sits motionless in the moving of the seasons, so too should we look within and slowly absorb the time. Within all the movement, the groundhog takes time to be still. Within all the changing of spring, we must take time to notice the constancy of inner devotion. No matter how much is going on outside of oneself, one still reaffirms what is in one's heart taking comfort in the regular pulse. What works in the shelter of home or temple works everywhere. Only when we know such constancy do we know that our quest is succeeding. Yeah, so we were just talking about this. I love how these chapters, like, flow into each other. Um, constancy. Dedication. Consistency. I think would be a more apt word here. Um, but constancy, yeah, that works. Uh, but doing it every day, right? Don't let up. Um, know that you are who you naturally are and don't let others move you. Now, that's not to say you should be stiff and rigid all the time, right? Uh, think of the bamboo, think of the palm tree. Have you ever seen those videos of hurricanes like coming in and crashing over the, you know, crashing over the, the shoreline? And those bamboo trees are bent like this, you know? But then, you know, you look down the street and like the oak tree is completely snapped over, the telephone pole is snapped over. Well, why? Like, why was this rubber tree flailing all about and lived? You know, maybe it had the leaves stripped off of it, some of the bark stripped off of it, but that tree down the street, no, it's gone because one was flexible and one was super rigid. And guess which one lived? The flexible. So you can be constant without being a pain in the ass, right? You can be who you are naturally and still. Be helpful and kind and courteous and loving towards others. In this chapter, 
I also uh, hints back at what I was saying earlier about when the world around you is going crazy, you still find that peace, right? You know who you are. Uh, here at the end, it says, no matter how much is going on outside of oneself, one still reaffirms what is in one's heart, taking comfort in the regular pulse. And that's right. There's comfort in knowing that tomorrow the sun's going to come up, right? Here in like 18 hours, I'm going to get to see another sunrise, hopefully, right? <laughs> Assuming nothing crazy happens. Um, have you ever been thankful for that? Try it. It's great. There was a period of about nine months where every day I woke up and on my Mastodon account, I said, uh, I am thankful for living to see another sunrise. And that's, that's worth it. Right. And I posted the picture. And you'll be amazed if you do something like that every day. Just be thankful for having the day. How different you'll feel about waking up. I remember waking up and I mean, we all have that. When you wake up and it feels awful. And you're just like, ah, I don't to do this. Why am I here? What is happening? <laughs> let me, please let me stay asleep. Um, I get it. Man, there are days like that where gee, you just don't want to do anything. When you're when you wake up every day, the first thing you say is I am thankful for waking up, it will change you. It will change the way you feel. Because I'm 41 years old. I have known too many people who went to bed and did not wake up. Nothing is guaranteed, guys. Like you could wake up. You could not wake up. Right? So every day you wake up is a gift. A chance. It's an opportunity. Use the opportunity that has been given to you. Um, use the chance to teach someone, to help someone, to serve them, to do something for someone. Do something for yourself, right? Treat yourself. Treat yourself. <laughs> buy, buy a CD, right? Buy, go get some boba tea or whatever it is you like, some Starbucks or something. That's what I'm going to do. As soon as I'm done with this stream, I'm going to go get coffee because it's early and it's really, really cold outside. So more coffee is needed. But I hope you're thankful for every day. I hope you're thankful for what you have. Uh, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for you being here. I'm thankful for this hour we just spent together. And for you guys, let me know the audio was messed up the whole time. <laughs> no, not the whole time, just the first five minutes. But don't worry, we'll cut that out in post and I will get this video up. Well, that's it, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'll be here next week, every Sunday, 9 a.m. Central Time. Um, convert that to your own time zone, wherever you are. You can check out the live stream on YouTube, or you can find the audio on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Substack, actually. So go there, too. Okay, I'll see you next week. Don't forget, Project Jade is tomorrow morning, projectjade.net. Woo! Bye, bye.